the truth of the matter is that at the end of this session today, everyone listening to me, you will become emotional, smarter, like never before. Is that a yes? Is that a yes? As I'm talking to you today, right now, the entire world system is changed. One day we were all in our various homes. And then we began to hear that there's something called Corona virus, termed COVID-19, that happened in one village called Wuhan. And at the end of the day, it's like what happened in China in one village has become headache for many other nations of the world, including Nigeria. Nigeria not left out. And the announcement, the way media took the coronavirus issue, it has transformed the way we do things like never before. In fact, the high level of economic decline is unbelievable. And when there is economic decline, you know, it brings a lot of headache for revenue generation agencies, not only in Nigeria, but in everywhere in the world. Am I correct? <laughs> and not only that, it generates stress. I'm sure that a lot of people sit there in this hall today, trust me, are really stressed. Is that correct? Stressed. I mean stressed. And the interesting thing is that if you are not stressed or because of workload, you'll be stressed also because of the economic environment. Environment means that a lot of you sit in this hall today, so many people are depending on you for their livelihoods. Is that a yes? <laughs> so, so if that is a yes, you realize that, especially where we come from, the cultural environment, how one person who has stepped forward ahead, who is working in an institution, will become suddenly many people's uncles, many people's grand uncles, as the case may be. If that is the reality of the situation, if there is any other demand of the 21st century of today, is the demand of a kind of leadership that is different. It is a demand of a kind of leadership that will no longer be autocratic. It is a demand of a new kind of leadership that is going to be a lot more participatory like never before. It's a demand of leadership with a soul. It's a demand about leadership with a heart. Therefore, anyone who is seated here today that is leading teams, Within your institution, you realize that at the moment that as I'm talking to you today, that if you do not step up your game like never before to understand the concept of emotional intelligence in a very practical way, what is going to happen is that you're going to be driving people crazy. And to be very honest, when you drive people crazy thinking they will produce, what happens is that people would actually step back into their, their shells. And at the end of the day, you might not be able to get productivity from them. But there's a mandate to be actualized. Is that not correct? The mandate must be realized. But you can't realize it alone. You need to work with teams. You need effective teams. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to first of all, maybe do a bit of introduction on the concept of leadership so that anyone listening can have a good foundation before we get into the subject of the day. My very good friend and mentor, Dr. Miles Monroe, defines leadership as the ability to inspire, motivate, drive a group of people towards a particular direction by inspiration, not intimidation or manipulation. 
I repeat that definition again. That leadership is the ability to influence, motivate, drive a group of people towards a particular direction via inspiration, not intimidation or manipulation. At the heart of that definition, you will be able to find five elements that I would like to bring forward to you. First one is the concept of the leader. The leader, which means nothing happens until somebody moves. Nothing happens until a leader takes responsibility and takes initiative. It means nothing happens until somebody catches a vision. Somebody catches a, a vision of a department that at the end of three months, at the end of six months, this is where we want to be as a department. Somebody takes that initiative and begins to catch the vision. When it catches the vision, it is the responsibility of the leader at that point in time to simply do what? Sell that vision to the members of what? Members of the team. So there must be a leader. The second element is that there must be a vision. If there is a leader, there must be what? A vision. And that vision is either transferred in a way that there is a buy-in. Some people might have a vision, but they will push the vision <laughs> on the people in such a way that whether you like it or not, you must, you must do what? You must accept this vision. But the context of what I'm saying here is that there is a vision. The, set, the third element is that there is the follower. There is a follower. So the follower buys the vision as a result of the respect and honor the place on the visionaire or the head of department, as the case may be. So in that context, for anybody to follow the leader, the leader must generate tremendous influence, which means you might not necessarily get that influence on the base of the authority that you have, which means you might occupy a position of leadership as officially a head of a department, but you don't have any influence. I don't know if anybody, if anybody has noticed what I'm talking about in systems. Somebody may occupy a position, but does not have the capacity to influence anybody. So imagine if you, for you to be able to get that quality of influence we're talking about, that is where emotional intelligence now becomes a very critical element that you must understand and utilize in order to be able to make the kind of influence and impact that you can make for people to be able to what, follow you and get the job done. So if that is the case, at the influence level is where we're talking to you about, whether you occupy a position of leadership or not, the ability to be able to get to a point where you become influential as a result of when people encounter you, when people experience you, they want to, on a consistent note, spend more time with you. They want to be motivated because they have experienced you to get things done in that sense. So what it means is that one powerful woman in the United Kingdom many years ago was asked, this woman had had an opportunity of spending time with two former prime ministers of England. One of them, David Gladstone. The other, Benjamin Disraeli. And she was asked one day, she said, amongst these two leaders, which of these leaders would you really say has inspired you so much that you can say this one is a great leader with high emotional intelligence? You know what she said? She said, whenever you are in the presence of Gladstone, you will think that Gladstone is the most intelligent man that has ever lived. But whenever you are in the presence of Benjamin Disraeli, you will think that yourself, you, you, you are the most intelligent person, an outstanding person that has ever lived. Amongst two of them, which one do you think is exercising the power of emotional intelligence? Disraeli. Benjamin Disraeli. Why? There are people that you leave their presence, you pray you never get to their presence again. There are people that you come into their presence, you want to come over and over again. There are bosses that you have, and you wish you never have them. 
you pray in the name. I never want to have this my boss again. There are bosses like that. In fact, let me even let you know, all of you seated in this hall, I'm glad that you are senior officers. Do you know that the younger officers have names for all of you? <laughs> I mean, if you, if, you, if, you, if you hear your name, you'll be shocked. What they, and, and the interesting thing is that you might think you're an outstanding leader. You know, you might think the temptation to say that I'm a leader. And you, and you deceive yourself that you are a leader. Meanwhile, they are holding meeting behind. They are saying, this man, hmm, this man doesn't know how to eat last. My friend Simon Sinek wrote a book, and he titled it, Leaders Eat Last. And he said, ah, this man, anything that enters his hand doesn't go out. <laughs> and they give him one name like that. And I'm telling you, this is so practical. It's so practical that you'll be shocked. That people will not follow because they just, they are only following because you are the head. That is the only entitlement for followership. Therefore, understanding this dimension of, of leadership is it, very interesting. And that is why Comrade Hilton, the founder of Hilton Hotels, this hotel we are staying, the founder of this hotel, you know what he said? He said he can pay any amount of money for anybody that has the capacity to freely, effectively work with all manner of human beings. Somebody with the ability to work with people effectively, he can pay any amount of money to hire them. So what it means is that there is a skill in emotional intelligence. When you embrace emotional intelligence, what it means is that it gives you the opportunity to exercise influence. Is that correct? And when you exercise influence, you exercise leadership. That's the beauty of emotional intelligence. So it is important, therefore, for us to be able to start with what is this, this emotional intelligence that we're talking about? What does it mean to be emotionally intelli intelligent and smart? What does it mean? So two powerful great guys. Peter Solave and John Mayer, many years ago, they introduced a concept of emotional intelligence that even excites me. According to them, they said, and I quote, emotional intelligence is the ability of a leader to perceive, perceive, assess, assess, Emotions, his emotions, the emotions, emotions of other people in order to generate emotions so as to assist thoughts, thoughts, so as to assist thoughts. To do what? To understand, to understand and energize emotional knowledge. For the purpose of reflecting again and again to utilize emo emotional knowledge for emotional growth. So what his definition is simply saying is that, that emotional intelligence is the ability for you as an individual to understand your own personal emotions and have the ability to understand the emotions and the workings of emotions of those who are around you, which means you understand what emotions work for you, you understand what works for you, your emotions, and then you know how to also perceive it in the lives of all the people who work around you. And one of the beautiful things in this whole definition basically is that emotional intelligence first must be understood by you. Every human being has the way his emotions work, am I correct? You have your workings, I have my own workings. The ability for me to be able to understand how my emotions work and then how I relate with other people's emotions around the same space is what prepares me to be emotionally smart. And there are actually five components of emotional intelligence that, about, I think about, about five of them, but I included one more from the Nigerian local content as a leadership authority. 
And that one more I included is called mind leadership. Starting from mind leadership. There are five of them. I included one. One more, mind leadership. Mind leadership, interestingly, is one of the first ways of understanding who you are and developing your emotional intelligence. First component, mind leadership. What is mind leadership? Mind leadership is the ability of a leader to create, to create a state of control, a state of control over your mind. That's a state of control. So you have control of your mind, and you create joy, peace. Remember, it's a state. Within your mindset, inspiration, you, you get perspective. You generate it from, for your own mindset for the purpose of what? For the purpose of inspiring yourself and inspiring others around you. Which means, as I'm talking to you today, the reality of Nigeria is so much that the fear and anxiety that is in the public domain, if you're not careful, you can die under depression. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. It is the truth of the air because every day there's one bad news. The, there's one bad <laughs> What did he say? More than one. On a daily basis, you have all types of bad news. And the truth of the matter is that if you don't secure your mind, secure, it's called mind security, the ability to secure your mind from external threat is mind leadership. So you protect your mind so that you do not respond. You know, res when, when, you, when you are not a good PR person, what you do is that somebody says you have done this, and then you go to the marketplace to defend yourself. What it means is that you are reacting. Is that correct? But a good PR strategist knows how to attack. So you, you become a leader, you do not, you, what you do is that you do not attack. You, sorry, you do not respond. You are always in the state of controlling what happens within. So if somebody says shut up your mouth, you don't say shut up your mouth in response to that. What do you do? You just give an excuse. Something might be wrong. With this person. Is that not a smart person? You're a smart person by doing so. So it means that you can protect your entire system deliberately so that people do not penetrate your heart and mind. And then you can also begin to ensure that only positive emotions dwell within your mind. Let me give you an instance. A gentleman, a billionaire from, from Germany, became, was very successful. And then one day he heard that the stocks were down. The stocks were down. You know what he did? He committed suicide. <laughs> yes, he committed suicide. But do you know what? A few days after committing suicide, the stock went back up again, like double. And imagine if that man had protected his mind from such external negative report and say, I will bounce back. Do you think that man would have died? No. <laughs> people don't know that what is killing people in this country is not coronavirus. A majority might not be coronavirus. It is actually the fear that is associated with the fact that I have coronavirus. How do you deal with that? Mind security. The second element is what we talk about, self-awareness. Self-awareness, the ability to know your strengths and your weaknesses. Anybody, in fact, Socrates was talking, he said, man, know thyself. Man, know thyself. You know your weakness, you know your strength. The ability to know your weakness and your strength is a great weapon for advancement. Do you know that there are a lot of people who don't know their temperament? Some people are actually, they have different types of temperament. Some have choleric, some are choleric, 